these other currencies and more that just simply do not exist anymore because they were all debt-based, government-backed currencies. And so this is not me telling you that the true value of this stuff is zero. This is the Federal Reserve whose job it is to regulate the rate and speed of inflation. And when they lost that control with all of this money printed, somehow they don't know what creates inflation. They Today, we're joined by Lynette Zhang. Lynette, welcome to Ron's Basement. Ron, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Well, you are certainly a very popular figure within the silver and gold community. And I can tell you from the Ron's Basement, Basement Dweller community, people are always asking me to have you back on the show. So it's a big honor. It, it's a big honor. Now, you, you and I, uh, one of the first times we talked, I, I, I will never forget this. I asked you, why do things feel like they're so crazy right now? And you said that's because we're getting to a tipping point. We're getting to the end. Do you think that's still the case, Lynette? I think we're closer today than we were when we had that conversation. Yes, just look around you at the craziness that we have in the political system, in the geopolitical system, in the inflation system. You know, um, yes, I'm, I'm, there is really no doubt in my mind where we are in the monetary velocity. Yes. Yeah. And it, and it feels like my fellow Americans, many of them are just uh, asleep and, and don't even realize that this is going on, just kind of living in, would you almost say like a fantasy world or, you know, I mean, I guess maybe that's why we can feel, or I can feel, I can't speak for you a little crazy at times is because everybody else just walks around like everything's great. But I, 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 you know, when you look at the facts of like the list you just mentioned, it's, it can be a little scary at times. Which is why people just really, you know, want to bury their head in the sand and say, la, 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 and it's <laughs> happening. But in reality, ignorance doesn't make you immune. It just leaves you vulnerable. And I think that's why people are always surprised at this next event where I may be shocked that it happened at that moment, but I am not surprised that any of this is happening. Yeah, yeah. You you've seen it coming. Have you seen this building over a number of decades in your in your opinion? I in reality, it has been building since 1913 and then a big shift in 1971. But particularly in 2008, for me, not one little teeny weeny doubt in my mind. That's when the system really died. And that's when all they have left <laughs> this and they can just keep going and going and going and going and going into hyperinflationary depression, which is, I believe, has already started. Which is where we're going. So, 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 so 1913 was when the Fed was established. You said it kind of started with that. 1971 was when Nixon took us officially off the gold standard. 2008 seemed like um, instead of dealing with really dealing with the problems that we had, right? And maybe taking some pain and maybe having some consequences, the Fed took the easy route and, and used your, your money, your money printing machine. Um, you know, it, it has the Fed become, I, I can't think of a better word to describe this, but has the Fed become impotent? Has the Fed become, uh, have they lost their, have they, have they shot all their bullets, um, their real ammunition? And are we at a point now where, where devaluation of the dollar, which to me is just another way to say hyperinflation or inflation, the value of the dollar, where, where that has really um, uh, attained almost more power than the Fed? Does that, does that make sense? Well, it, it actually does make sense. If you're looking to buy gold, silver, or platinum, do yourself a favor and check out Pimbex, the online precious metals bullion dealer and sponsor of Ron's Basement. I was a happy customer before they offered to support the channel. You'll find they have the best prices, quality, and service. I think Pimbex is best, and you will too. And be sure to tell them that you're from Ron's basement. And I do think that the Fed and, and other global central banks, I mean, I think they're all impotent. I don't think that 
that they have any more sway because, you know, this is a con game. I mean, this stuff is based on debt and the full faith and credit, the government's ability to grow more debt. That's what creates and supports this thing. And when you look at the purchasing power, I mean, if, if you said to me, you can only use one chart, which one do you want? I would say I want <laughs> one on the purchasing power of the consumer dollar from the Federal Reserve Education Department, the FRED. That is, frankly, one of my very favorite websites. I mean, I just keep that pinned up all the time because I'm in there looking at this, that, or the other thing. But the key piece on that is that here's, I can't give you a lot of guarantees, but I can give you this guarantee. At some point, all assets move to their true fundamental value. And on that graph, if you look on the index on the left-hand side, what do you see? You see a big fat zero, just like all these other currencies and more that just simply do not exist anymore because they were all debt-based, government-backed currencies. And so this is not me telling you that the true value of this stuff is zero. This is the Federal Reserve whose job it is to regulate the rate and speed of inflation. And when they lost that control with all of this money print, somehow they don't know what creates inflation. They even admit that they don't understand inflation, which is awfully scary since their job is to regulate the rate and speed of inflation. All they really want to do is keep it at a level that you don't notice, that you don't go out and say, hey boss, I need more money, right? And, and look, that was the answer to the inflation that they created, which was to hurt the hurt the um the workers mm -hmm. to slow down the economy to a point where well guess what we we had this little bit of a run in increased income for workers for the masses for you know all of that and that's slowed down now hasn't it and we've got unemployment that's rising at the same time that that job availability is declining this is what the Fed did. This was the answer, not greedflation or shrinkflation, right? I mean, not the corporations that whose CEOs make thousands of times what the average worker makes. I mean, certainly that's justified, you know, and I hope everybody understands that I'm being very facetious when I say this, you know, so they don't go to the root cause. Have they lost control? Yeah, the markets are in control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and, and when you look at the when you look at the distribution of wealth in the country, um, you know, and there's all, just statistics that are mind blowing about you know how much what percentage of the wealth the top one percent of people own or the top three percent own more than the bottom fifty percent. I mean, it's just crazy that it's it's obvious that what the Fed has done has not helped the average person. And, you know, I thought of something when you were, when you were speaking, you know, the Fed's goal is to have 2% inflation. I mean, that's their, you know, stated policy. Why, why do they have to have any inflation would be my question. And number one, even if it's just 2%, eventually, eventually, even at 2%, eventually it becomes worthless, right? I mean, it might take a lot longer. 100% and that and that's it that's why I said when when Nixon closed that gold window in 71 he basically handed over power to regulate the rate and speed of inflation to the central bank which is it their job is not to protect the public their job is to protect the banking sector yeah. and the the assumption is, is that the banking sector will loan more money into existence. Mm -hmm. So, no, the Fed doesn't exist for the public. They want that 2% because at 2%, you don't change your behavior. What you do do, and we have seen this, is you grow more debt to try and sustain a standard of living. 
But frankly, when you have people that when they're buying their basic groceries have to do it on those, you know, in four payments or put it on a credit card, they can't pay for today's groceries. Guess what? You got to eat tomorrow too. That shows you how little, and do we really need the Fed? If we go back to a gold standard and guess what? If we utilize the blockchain technology to vote, boy, we can sure cut out an awful lot of fat. <laughs> and you know, and, and you, you, you brought up something brilliant or you made a connection for me in my mind, which is going to be, that's quite an achievement. Um, and that is that, that the Fed is, and I knew this, but I never really thought about this. The Fed is owned not by the United States people. The Fed is owned by, what is it, eight big banks, right? So Federal Reserve banks, yeah, the commercial banks, yeah. Yeah, and so who are they beholden to? They're not beholden to the U.S. people. They're beholden to the big banks. Their job is to, I never, I guess I knew that, but it never really sunk in. How, how important. And I think most Americans, I know, you know, ask, I ask my neighbors uh, this question from time to time when, when they're bugging me at the neighborhood pool and I don't feel like talking. Uh, nobody knows that the Fed is, is not even part of the U.S. government, that the Federal Reserve is no more federal. The Federal and Federal Reserve is no more federal than the Federal and Federal Express, right? Mm-hmm. Pe- people just assume that this is part of the United States government. It's like, no, it's a privately owned bank owned by a bunch of big banks. Who do you think they're looking out for? Duh. <laughs> well. Rocket science is just the basics. And so, yeah. And and when you look at what just happened with um, the reserve requirement for the Basel III endgame, yeah. right, where they were coming in at 19%. Now, remember, we've been in an ample reserve regime, which basically means that if a bank gets into trouble, Fed is going to do more of this, right? That's the reserve regime, but they were going to have them hold 19%. And oh my goodness, all that lobbying by the big banks. And now it's down to 9%. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. So they take all the teeth out of the regulations anyway. And I believe there was a regulator installed at SVB before it failed. And they didn't pick up on any of that either. Yeah. Those two martini lunches. (laughs) Well, Lynette, I think we're causing some problems. I've got somebody down here in the basement who is not happy with us and what we're talking about. He wants to briefly say hello. He lives, he lives in this box and, uh, uh, he he met you last time. His name's uh, Jerome Powell. He's he's, he's yeah. shaking over here in his, in his box. On camera, let's have a conversation. <laughs> yeah, let's. I've I've invited him to the basement many times. I'm like, there's an open invitation to sit down here and for he and I to have a talk. And he just he just never shows up. Is it safe to say that in 1971, when Nixon took the United States off the gold standard, and I think it was 19. 19- 64 they took silver out of the money so in 71 that just ended our money's uh connection or root rooting to any type of, of of precious metals did the dollar and gold and silver become they went from being like best friends to becoming almost like enemies like almost what happens a lot of times during a divorce between a couple is that is that a safe assessment Well, I'd say that the relationship really started to deteriorate in the 40s when the U.S. promised and vowed to keep the value of the dollar at 35 bucks to one ounce of gold. But the problem was, is they were funding wars, the Korean War and then the Vietnam War. And so we didn't do it. We reneged, now that's not ever the way they're going to tell you in the history books, but we reneged on our agreement. That's why the whole rest of the world agreed to peg or tie their currency to the U.S. dollar because we made that promise and we broke it. And then, I mean, I want you to think about this for a second, because up until 1933, 
if you walked into any bank with, uh, now I can't, here's a $20 bill. Okay, if you walked into any bank with this, mm -hmm. you could walk out with this. What wow. does behind a currency or to support a currency is it requires fiscal responsibility. That is not something that governments want to do. They want to tax and spend. But the public had the power because if you did not like what that government was doing, you'd walk in with this, you'd walk out with that, and that would create those restrictions. So they had to take it away from us, and they did in 1933. But the rest of the world could still send in these and take out these. So there was actually, and there, there's all the data, so it's not my opinion, it's data, hard data, a run on the dollar in the 60s. And some of you guys that are old enough like I am, because I'm about to be 70, can remember Charles de Gaulle coming on camera and saying that they didn't trust the dollar anymore. And that's, and so and you can see the chart, so much so that by the time that Nixon closed that gold window, they say it so nicely. It should be by the time that President Nixon reneged on the agreement that was established in, I think, 48, mm -hmm. we had less gold in deep storage than we did prior to the 1933 confiscation. Wow. Wow. It's, so, it's, and, and since 1971, I read the other day, post-1971, uh, the, the dollar has lost, like, I think it was 98% of its value relative to gold. I mean, what does that tell us? Uh, what does that tell us? Is, does that mean that the gold is worth that much more or really that the dollar is worth that much less? Yeah. Because the gold is worth about that much, about the same. It buys roughly the same amount of goods and services, but that's what, <laughs> that, that's what we'd like the dollar to do also. Right. I mean, Exactly. And, you know, I've been running this thing and I, I do it every once in a while, but I've been doing it more lately. And it's really interesting because anybody can go on a currency converter web, uh, website, right? Mm -hmm. and put in, if you know currencies that have done overnight devaluations like Ethiopia or Nigeria or, or Zimbabwe or Argentina or, you know, so there's a, like a lot of countries just recently that have done those overnight devaluations. And if you put in there the U.S. dollar to that currency, you'll see a big spike up in the dollar. Mm -hmm. but then if you put even the manipulated spot silver market, silver outperforms the dollar. Uh -huh. it, and also, it's so fascinating because it's every single time. It's the same thing every single time. If you then put spot gold in to that other currency, that even outperforms more. And I just did a piece where I was looking at a, feed, a food basket, and I was using data from the Bureau of Labor Statics, to Statistics. Huh, easy for you to say. <laughs> anyway and comparing the prices of specific goods of foodstuffs staples really from 1913 to 1924 the most current bls report mm -hmm. and i mean i don't know where you find a loaf of bread for two dollars and 96 cents but it might exist somewhere all right i'll take the word for it now i'm not going to be to the penny in here because i don't have it in front of me but the food inflation in that basket, according to the BLS, was something like 2,500%. Wow. Silver, spot silver, to the ounces of silver to buy that same food basket was like 2,900%. Mm -hmm. so silver actually maintained your ability to buy the same goods and services over that long period of time and is why I personally use silver for barter. Mm -hmm. But when you put the gold in, it was somewhere over 12,000 percent. 12,000 yeah. percent. So not only does gold maintain your ability to purchase the same goods and services over time, 
but it also puts you in a position to thrive through this. Mm -hmm. And right now where we have those income producing assets at ridiculously nosebleed levels because they've been targeted for reflation, their words, not mine, reflation, and you have physical gold and silver via the spot market suppressed, it's real value hidden and suppressed, that's going to flip-flop. Yeah. yeah. First Mining Gold is a development company advancing two of the largest gold projects in Canada, Spring Pole in Ontario and Du Parquet located in Quebec. Each already has 5 million ounces of gold reserves, but exploration initiatives are underway at both projects to find even more gold. First Mining is well financed, has zero debt, and owns an interest in four additional Canadian gold development projects. It's interesting you say that because like if I think about, you know, if I had $10,000 that I could either put into Apple computer stock or silver, um, number one, I'm an account, I have a degree in accounting. I love to look at financial statements. I mean, I know that Apple stock from a fundamental perspective is just the assets you get for each share. It's, it's so overvalued. It's incredible. Right. And then from a price to earnings or a price to sales perspective, but then also I thought you'd think about this, Lynette, not only that, but it's measured in dollars right? It's based on dollars. So it's like a double Ponzi almost, you know, I'm like, this is the craziest thing ever. And yeah. whereas I could have this stuff, you know, here's three, here's three, uh, uh, you know, old silver dollars. I'll take the silver in a second. Absolutely. You know, if, I, if I look out over a 10 or 20 or five or one day period, even I'm going to take the silver. Well, you know, and not only that, because Definitely to your point, all you can do is convert that Apple stock into fiat money. That's yeah. all you can do with it. It is used in one area of the economy. So when demand for these go away, what do you got? <laughs> but physical gold and physical silver are used in every single sector of the global economy. Yeah. They have the broadest base of functionality. This is one. This is every single sector of the global economy. This is a bazooka. This <laughs> is this. Yeah. And when you're going into a knife fight, do you want a pen? <laughs> Yeah, I, I, well, that that leads me perfectly into what I, I want to I want to talk with you about, which is the cage match that we have right now between what I see the U.S. dollar and gold. But I want to hit back on one point you brought up, which I think is so interesting and, and something that really uh, came to surface for me over the last couple of months. And that is that, you know, we all know gold and silver have been valuable for thousands of years. And that's a big attribute, right? That amount of time, the dollar has been valuable for whatever, but it's everywhere but not only is it everywhere, but if like when I, especially and it's true for gold, but I was more focused on silver when I thought about this, the number of people in the world who participate in the silver market, it could, it could quite possibly be from a, from a human participation perspective, the biggest market in the world, because there aren't that many humans, you know, that are buying and selling crude oil or bushels of wheat or but there's a lot of humans out there, uh, maybe not in the United States, but when you look at India, China, all over the world that own silver. Yeah. And any form, you yeah. know, sterling silver spoons and iced teaspoons and chopsticks and salt and pepper shakers and, <laughs> right. and jewelry, 925 jewelry, sterling jewelry, it's 92 and a half percent pure. And, you know, I always wear my jewelry and truthfully, when my daughters were 12, that's when I started them on, on good jewelry, right? Mm -hmm. And I did that because I wanted them, I wanted them to always have money. Even if they weren't near me, they're off to college, which obviously they weren't at 12, but they took their jewelry with them when they went to college. Because, and when I travel, I have certain travel pieces of jewelry that I use. 
Mm-hmm. So that if I need, if something happens and I yeah. need money wherever I am in this world, I can convert it just like that. Yeah, it's cra- it's crazy. I mean, and like you said, well, you, you brought up this point, right? The dollar uh, is, you know, like bringing a knife fight to a gun or, or to a gunfight. I want to get your opinion on this. Um, Bank of America recently published some some research that stated that gold has now become the world's preferred reserve asset, second only to the U.S. dollar. So the gold moved up. It overtook the euro. Right. So so in my mind, I thought, here we go. It's game on. It's like it's like a cage match or a boxing match. It's the final you know, the final, they're, they're in the ring together. And as I thought about it, I was just, I'm like, it, like, I almost imagine like, you know, let Lynette and I go to, we're at a boxing match and we have to place a wager on who's going to win this match. And I'm like, in this corner, we have the U S dollar backed by, you know, 50 years of, of decreasing value of, you know, backed by $35 trillion in debt. And in this corner, we have precious metals, gold and silver. They've got a 5,000 year track record of never losing any value. Uh, and, and, and this goes with your, with your pile of, of pay, paper fiat that has gone bad. Not only that gold and silver had been in this fight hundreds of times. Is it hundreds of times? Thousands. And, oh. thousands. and they've won every time they've, they got a perfect record. Who are we going to bet on? Not this stuff. <laughs> I mean, I mean whether you're looking at the central banks or you're looking at a government, can anybody actually look themselves in the eyes or look anybody else in the eyes and say, this entity has my best interest at heart and my children's best interest at heart? No, it it used to be that the individual was at the top of the food chain and then the states, I mean, the constitution, right? I mean, what old relic. Then the states were there to support the rights of the individual. Mm-hmm. And then the federal government was there to support the states who were supposed to support the rights of the individual. That's flip-flopped, right? Yeah. Now, yeah. how long do we have to work to pay our taxes? And where is that money going? Because quite honestly, it's so easy to spend someone else's money, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I, I think about, I thought about this earlier as you were speaking you know, when they took us off the gold standard, uh, it, it, it took away that discipline. It took away that, you know, it, so it's almost like my wife, Susie and I, if like we were, you know, are any married couple that is living within their means and living, you know, li- spending the same or less than they earn. Yes. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden we say, you know what, we've got six credit cards. We've got, you know, we can, we can, let's just blow all the money and have a great time. But at some point, even if you're the United States, and, and, and you correct me if you think I'm wrong, but at some point, the, the natural rules of mathematics apply even to the biggest, baddest guy in the room, right? I mean, because people say, oh, nothing, it can't happen like Argentina. It could never, well, could it? Yes, and actually it will, and it already has begun as witnessed by the monetary velocity. Right. So we're already, in my opinion, and actually, according to the data that I'm looking at, that I believe, I believe firmly that we are already in the beginning stages of that hyperinflation. It just isn't obvious yet, but watch this pivot. Mm -hmm. Watch this pivot. Yeah. 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 You know, everybody and everybody's always so is so focused on the Fed. You know, my little friend Jerome in the box. What's the Fed going to do? What's the Fed going to do? And and I'm getting more and more. What's that? I wish you could keep him in that box. <laughs> yeah, I keep him in the box. Well, I, I, not like all of this is because of Jerome. It's just. No. T- he's, he's symbolic of what's going on. But I'm becoming more and more attuned with the fact that what it's really about now is inflation. Or, again, that's just another way to say devaluation of the dollar in that that's what's going to drive the bus in the next 10 years. And that. The Fed has, has, is becoming, you know, their, their tools, uh, you know, and do they even really want to fight inflation? I mean, yeah. it- I so agree with that because I absolutely knew that the system died in 2008, but they didn't have the new system in place. Mm-hmm. I 
don't think it was a coincidence that that Bitcoin came out in January of 2009 when quantitative easing came out in March of 2009. Because look at how much money would have gone into physical gold had that not happened. And the other thing is, it's a tr in my opinion, and I know there's going to be a lot of people that disagree with me, but it's a Trojan horse because there are, to your point earlier, thousands of instances. I mean, these are just a few of the currencies. There's over 4,800 currencies that do not exist anymore. And the way they make that transition, I mean, read their documentation. They tell you, we know how to do this. We just keep things looking as normal as possible so that people don't realize that anything has changed. And, you know, I do happen to have in here because I ordered them in a $20 bill. What's the date on this one? 1977 and a $20 bill from 1969. Look at freaking look exactly yeah. the same. They were completely different. 69 still had at least a quasi gold backing. Mm -hmm. And I remember, I'm old enough to remember Nixon saying, oh, if you just buy American, don't worry about it because we're not going to experience inflation. What is their job? To lie. Yeah. To lie and lie and lie. And you should have a box with Janet Yellen in there with earplugs because that woman is tone deaf. Do you? Yay! <laughs> That's perfect. I don't now, have the I don't have the earplugs. You know that would have been a little creepy if I'd pulled that one off. But uh, Janet Yellen, there you go. Yeah, all right. I, I mean, you're, we're not going to see another financial crisis in her lifetime, and more. <laughs> I mean, the economy is so strong and look at, we are creating so many jobs here that it can absorb anybody that wants to come into this market. Well, they should tell that to the 2024 college grads, or they should tell it to all of those people that are getting laid off while the jobs, yes. What about the 818,000 people that had make-believe jobs over to, I'm sorry, but I had to throw that in. Please, I'm so glad you did, because I probably would have forgotten to mention it, and you're 100% correct. Fortuna Mining is a global intermediate gold and silver producer. Since 2005, Fortuna's best-in-class management has delivered impressive growth and profits. Fortuna's solid financial position and operational expertise allows for performance in any precious metals price cycle, but also provides a foundation from which to harvest robust profits in more favorable metals markets. Investing in Fortuna is an investment in quality, long-term, sustainable production of in-demand precious and base metals. You know, they'll come out with stuff and then there's revisions. And let's yeah. see really think it was only that 818,000? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I, I don't know if they, maybe they were cashing their make-believe paychecks during that period as well. Well, they probably were because, you know, isn't this a make-believe paycheck anyway, right? I mean, what the heck? <laughs> it is. Yeah. You no, know, I did a little thing once because it's more eye-opening. So I've been using this a lot more. If I'm talking about a topic and then I'm going all the way back and showing that in the beginning in terms of dollars, in terms of gold, in terms of silver, right? Mm -hmm. And then bring it forward. And there hasn't been one case, not one case where the dollar has lost lots of purchase, like your, like your income. Let's just go to 1971 when we completely went off the gold standard. The average wage was 10,500 bucks at that time. I don't have this in front of me, so I'm going to be off a little bit. But had you been paid in gold at that time at $35 an ounce or even go to $42.22 because that's what they reset it to when they went off the gold standard, you would have been paid with something like 271 ounces of gold. Yeah. If you never got a raise, 
The average income is now something like, I think, $63,000 a year. Mm -hmm. So you would sit there and go, well, I would much rather have 63,000 than 10,500, except that the cost of living has expanded so rapidly and so much. If you never got a raise and were just paid in 271 ounces of gold, that equates out to somewhere of six, $700,000. You would have sustained your standard of living. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And to think that that the American standard of living has not crashed since even the 70s. I was born in 1970. My, I was raised middle class. My my dad was uh, in the Missouri Air National Guard full time, rose to the highest rank of an enlisted guy. He wasn't making he was making a middle class income. We had a nice house in St. Louis, a nice little house. We had two cars. We went to Disney World. We went on nice vacation every summer. I went to private grade school and high school. We probably ate higher quality food than the average American family eats right now. My mom didn't have to start working and she only worked part time, I think, when I was 10 or 11. And to think now, I mean, a one income middle middle like equivalent of what my dad was doing, they could hardly afford the trip to Disney World. I mean, it's it's crazy. Oh my God. Yeah, that's true. I think the entry fee is something like what, two, 300 bucks or something like that. Yeah. 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 I mean, you're going to, you're going to drop 10 grand. <laughs> We're going to Disney world with that. And you know, there's something else in what you said that I would like to just kind of bring up because your mom stayed home and was like the heart of the family. Yeah. So when you were home from school, she was there, right? Yes. Yep. And they knew because if you read again if you read what's going on they wanted to put the women and and look i've worked my whole life and i've always worked in male dominated fields so i don't really want anybody to misconstrue and i was a single mom since my daughters were three and they're going to be 43 or 44 this yeah. year yeah they're twins right they are twins yeah. and you can't let them see that because they're like you don't know how old we are <laughs> Or 30, 34, we'll, we'll correct that, right? We'll go with that. Okay. Um, no, they're 44. All right. Okay. All right. And, but, but the point is, is that it's in everything I've seen since, it's kind of like a divide and conquer. It's mm -hmm. the degradation of the family unit. And I'm not saying that all women should stay home. I'm not saying any of that at all, because I think everybody should have a choice. Yeah. I am saying is that that degradation was intentional and all we've seen, especially with what happened with the Cervasa disease in 2020, it's divide people, divide people, divide yeah. people. Everything is so politicized. So we're sitting here saying you, 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 right? Pointing a finger when in reality, that means we're not talking. That means that we're not communicating and 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 helping each other through this, and we're not pay, we're paying attention to pointing fingers instead of looking in the mirror, and instead of coming together to support each other. Yeah. That was absolutely intentional, and that's where I have a problem. I, I think everybody needs to make the choices that are right for them, and I can't tell right. you what those choices are for you. I can only tell you what they are for me. However, I do believe that we need a choice and I don't think people have that choice anymore. No, and it, well, you know, my wife doesn't work and it's very difficult, right? I'll say that and we have, I have twin 12 year old, old daughters. Um, I think it is, um, it, it's, just, it's also interesting to consider that now a dual income family in today's world, right? can barely afford the same lifestyle that a single income family could afford. And whether it's the, the, the dad working or the mom working, whatever, we do know one thing for sure, when they're both working full-time jobs and working hard, it's taking away from their time and focus on their family. There, I think, I think you, you can't, it's really hard to argue that point. Um, it is. I mean, if, you know, for me, I didn't really have, the help and it was a struggle to figure out how to support these babies and yeah. raise them. And I just was working all the time. I mean, you yeah. know, I gotta, 
start my next job. I got uh, a feel. I got a feeling you did a great job. <laughs> I'm very proud of my children and yeah. we're close, and they're 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 successful, and they're contributing people to the world, and they were my focus. So thank you very much. I I'm going to accept that. Yeah, I would say 100%. I can, with a high level of confidence, you did a pretty awesome job. So, uh, Lynette, this has been great. Did I did I forget to ask you about anything? Any other points you wanted to you wanted to bring up? Ron, there are so many things like <laughs> for hours and hours and hours. Yeah, it's been it's 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 always great to talk to you. Now, if people want to see more of you, you have a YouTube channel. How would they? I'll put a link to it in the description of this video, but how would they, or, or how else could they get in touch or learn more about you? I'm very, very visible on YouTube and on Twitter. I'm at the Lynette Zhang on Instagram and Facebook. I'm at lynettezhang.com. And I will tell you that, that probably my key focus these days is on building community both locally, because I know 100% that food becomes the biggest issue for most people in these transitions. And we're seeing it. We're seeing it all over the place. Not, not in foreign countries. We're seeing it in the U.S. as well. And also globally, because we have to stand for sound money. And we can create this very quiet and peaceful revolution just by converting this garbage into sound money. And if we do that and we do it on a global basis, we need to do it on a statewide basis here in the US and, and urge our politicians to make gold and silver legal tender officially again. Mm -hmm. But on a global basis, we need to have a seat at the table, Ron. We need to have a say in the new currency and the new monetary system that's coming out. And if I'm sitting at that table, not only do I want it backed by gold, but I want it convertible into gold. Yeah. Because if it's not convertible, you're not going to be able to check it. And it's yeah. just going to be a big fat lie. That's kind of what they're finding in Zimbabwe as they're trying to regain the confidence of the public. Mm -hmm. In gold and silver, I trust. <laughs> not the Fed, not the politicians. In gold and silver, I trust. Yeah, and you can hold it in your hand. I know we have some organizations here in the U.S. One of them is uh, Citizens for Sound Money. Uh, they're working across the country, state by state. Um, I know even here in Missouri, they were helping out with the Missouri Freedom Initiative to try to we're still working on it, but there are a good number of states that have passed legal tender legislation and it's kind of getting chipped away year by year. And um, I mean, and I was, and, and I'll end with this thought. I was thinking about this other day, the founding fathers of our country had Lynette Zhang, Ron Branstetter, uh, everybody in the country in mind when they wrote that document, right? I think Lynette, and, and Ron still have them in mind, but most of our fellow Americans don't. They've kind of forgotten about the fact that they really, you know, they knew the fundamental kind of timeless uh, factors uh, that would come into play in the future. So it's good to see that we do have a growing number of states that are working to pass this legal tender legislation. Yeah, absolutely. Because, I mean, really what gave me hope was when uh, President Biden changed the status of marijuana. Mm -hmm. Why did he do that? He did that because there was enough pressure from the states. Yeah. So if we can come together in the states and legalize it enough. You know, I mean, this is what we have to do. We have to have a sound money movement or, you know, I mean, I'm not so worried about me. I'm not actually even that worried about my children because of what I've managed to be able to, to do and accumulate. And I know I have a good, solid, sound money portfolio, but I care about the world, yeah. right? If not me, who? If not now, when? I, I challenge every single person to look in the mirror and ask that question. Mm -hmm. If not me, who? If not now, when? One person can't do it. But together, I mean, this is something that we've been witnessing with the rise of the unions and all of the political protests that are going on. And even China had to change things when their population rose up in unison. Yeah. 
Yeah. Community is arguably the single most important thing that I can really talk about. Although a lot of people don't want to hear that piece. So I have to talk about why, which is all the garbage we've already talked about. <laughs> right. You know, but, but that's what we have to do because if we don't, then we can't complain about what we get. Yeah. Yeah. Your CBDC or whatever, because if you look even just a, a, a brief study of history will plainly indicate to anyone that when when the world is operating on a more gold and silver centric standard, it's a much more peaceful and prosperous place for a, the greatest number of people. So I agree with you 100 percent, Lynette. I'm going to look forward to seeing you uh, next time in the basement. I know on behalf of myself and our viewers, uh, thank you so much. And I know you do a lot for the silver and gold community. So thanks for uh, for joining me today. Thank you for having me. And and I, I really do appreciate it. And I, I appreciate all the support. I mean, it's really quite heartwarming. Yeah. I'm the same as everybody else out there. I just looked in the mirror and said, if not me, who? And if not now, when? And what else do I have to do? <laughs> Well, you're doing great, and uh, we're going to look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks, Lynette. Bye.